sing to God, sing praises to His name, lift up a song to Him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exult before Him, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in His holy habitation. May we invite you to join us in worshipping this God who is our Father, a good, good Father. May we stand up and join in worship. Perfect. 
we take our seats. A very good morning and welcome to IBC. Um, so IBC is God's Homes for the Nations, and uh, from whatever nation you're, you're from, you're always very welcome here. So I just wanted to start with um, welcoming anybody who's new to IBC. If you're new here, we'd like to just um, say hi and pass you a welcome pack uh, from our usher. So if you're new, please uh, raise your hands. Or if you have, uh, haven't been to IBC for many years and we just come back recently, also raise your hands. Anyone who's new to IBC today? No? Okay, I think we're all homegrown today, so welcome everyone anyway. So maybe just raise your hands if you feel the joy for the Lord today. Just raise your hands. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. So I just got a couple of announcements today. Um, the first announcement is about um, our church ACM. So that's our annual congressional meeting that's happening here on the next Sunday after the second service at around 12.30. So that's going to be lunch. And then after lunch, we'll be sitting down to listen about updates from the church. It could be... Um, um, our, our new uh, deacons, elders, um, financial updates, uh, church updates. So please, if you're a member, please attend that uh, next Sunday. And then the uh, second announcement I have is on our elder confirmation. So if you haven't uh, uh, filled out the form uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, please do so today. Today's the last day to actually help us affirm and support Andrew Lowe um, for eldership so you have to fill out the form um, if, if you're a member and you just uh, just a reminder you have to actually sign it for us to validate that and then put it into the uh, voting box at the back of the in the gathering area so those are the two announcements and i'm just going to invite pastor ronnie up on stage right now to just uh, welcome us and also say a prayer thank you thank you Yo, this is johan one of our deacons and as well as making himself visible and known where if you ever need any help he'll just always around but uh, i met a couple last night i don't i didn't think this was possible but i did they said pastor this is our first time back since COVID. i went huh that's like four years ago. So I was like in shock. But, and they've been watching online. So they, they kind of got, um, they said, Pastor, when you took us off live stream, we were forced to come back. So anyway, if you're here, whatever reason you're here, we're glad that you are. We love the face-to-face. -face. We love the personal presence more than anything else. And so today is a very special day. Other than the Lord's Day, which is about to take priority over everything, there is another element today. Anybody know what today is? Father's Day. Some of our guys and ladies were in shock last night when we called them Happy Father's Day um, a little bit early in our evening service. So I know all of you woke up knowing that it's Father's Day, right? Yes. But the good thing is you can salvage your life because Father's Day does not end until 12 p.m. tonight. So you can make arrangements, make some quick adjustments, and act like it's very fresh. All right. But if you are a father today, I'm going to ask every single father to stand right now. We have a special gift that we would like to give you. Let's, let's give our appreciation for our fathers. <laughs> remain standing, fathers. Remain standing. We just love you. What a testimony to see our strength of our men and our fathers today. But I'm going to pray over you. But before I do, I just want to encourage you as fathers that this is a time that um, we get to honor not only our fathers, but as we honor our fathers, we honor our heavenly father as well. And so as we are obedient to honor your father and your mother, we honor our heavenly father. But some of us fathers, our kids are a little bit distant from us and they're not quite here. Some of you are, some of you are enjoying and basking in the presence of your children all the time. Um, some of us are going through all kinds of different shifts. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray and after the prayer, I'm gonna ask the men to stay standing and whoever is in your section, whether you know them or not, I need you to go up and say, Happy Father's Day, all right? Now, I may not know you, and you say Happy Father's Day to me, and you have warmed my heart. So it, it, it doesn't matter if you know them or not, just as a father to hear. So today, I, I, we called our middle son, our middle son called us with a granddaughter, and um, I said, should I say Happy Father's Day to my son first? Or should I wait for him to say it to me since I'm the elder? So it was a little battle going on right then. I didn't know which one to go first, but um, since he is also a father as well. But I finally went for and I said, son, happy Father's Day. And this is what he said, happy Father's Day, pop. <laughs> so it just warmed my heart to hear that. But we, whenever us dads, when we hear it, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It just sounds good. So we're going to bless 
with the body of Christ and the family of God here. But let me pray over our fathers, and then I want everybody to stand and greet a father who's standing in your section, all right? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for our fathers. What a testimony of strength, of um, consistency, of provision, of, of just following you and leading you and leading the family. Father, I thank you so much for just the ability that we have as we honor our earthly fathers, that we also honor our heavenly father. Father, I pray today as we set aside this day and we, we just acknowledge not only who they are and what they've done, but the gift they are to us. Father, we pray as we go through this worship service, Father, that we'll just again um, leave with a very grateful heart for the gift that you've given us in our fathers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Fathers, remain standing still. Everybody, attack, I mean, um, address. Go, go, go. Happy Father. We are children to this father, father to the fatherless. And as children, we are called upon to worship this God from wherever we are, whether it be in Asia or Africa or the Amazon plains. Hallelujah. Shall we stand up once again and worship this God who deserves praises from his children. Oh 
Cause all the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. Shall we raise our song to the of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles it's only this holy God Commands all the hosts of heaven. Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper when darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What are the beauty? such praises what are the splendor that shines the sun what are the majesty rules with justice only a holy
only he deserves our praise. Oh, 
lost in anything. No gift, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death, His resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. What love, what sacrifice that reflects a truly Father's heart and Lord, you seek us to respond to you in obedience, to place you in the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. By obeying and denying our own selves, just like Jesus did, that we might please you, God, and worship you for your love and your sacrifice. We pray that you will prepare our hearts for your word. And we pray that you will bless the offerings that we bring to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to bring tithes and offerings to God. Good morning, obviously. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up to Matthew chapter 10. And many of you know that we've been in this journey in the Gospel of Matthew, especially in the teaching sections. A couple weeks ago, we introduced to you following, come and follow, obviously. But every week, we've been offering and opening up with the same question. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Seems like a simple question, especially if we're talking to a group that are gathered to the most holy of all the IBC services. Amen? That was kind of a question or not. But as you gather here today, the, the body of Christ have come together to say, you know what, we are followers of Christ. This is why we worship. But many times we define or describe our following Christ in our terms. We describe it according to what we perceive what that means. But we're going to be challenging you today, especially from, from the word of God, and especially from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ, what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. We started off in Matthew chapter 10 that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, that he invites his disciples in the first century into us is to go into our home territories, to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his face, to be his voice. And then as we continue that walk with Jesus Christ and we follow him, he's going to also call us into hostile territories. We talked about even in the government realm or even the political realm or in the religious realm, and sometimes even our own families turn against us and they become hostile toward us. And last week, we were encouraged you, remember, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. But now we come to the title of this morning's message that begins in verse 32, the priority of following Jesus Christ. The tragedy of 21st century Christianity, we often put our Christianity in a slot along with other items, such as, well, our business, our work, our career, our school, our training, our tuition, our family, our friends, our network, our hobbies, our traveling, uh, uh, our, our, all of our possessions. And we got this, and then all of a sudden we put church in one of the many categories. 
Sometimes we even put a priority of our relationship with Christ based on what's going on around us, whether it's in the political realm, whether it's in the economy, whether it's in the pandemic, whatever it might be. And it seems like all of those things can actually throw our alignment and our priority of Jesus Christ off. But we're going to challenge you today from God's word that Christ should be the priority of everything we do across all areas. He's not one of many. He is the one. Sometimes even churches have challenges when it comes to putting the priority on Jesus Christ. There was a pastor who was visiting Atlanta, Georgia, in the southeastern part of the United States. And as he was visiting, he wanted something to eat, and he saw an advertisement that kind of caught his heart as well as his stomach. It says, the Church of God Grill. Now, if you're a pastor, how can you not go there, right? Church of God Grill. So he called and wanted to set reservations, and, but he, he was talking to the owner. And he says, hey, how do you get your name? Church of God Grill grill he said well we were a church plant and we were hurting in money so we needed to raise the money so we had church members that started making chicken dinners and so business began to pick up and money started coming in and things were going well especially in the south and the part of the u.s you get fried chicken going on it's all going good and the business got to increase and so it increased so much that we had to actually cut down on some of our services so the priority of chicken dinners grew greater than the priority of worship services. In fact, business boomed so much that we decided to do away with services altogether. But we decided to keep the name. How many times do we as followers of Christ, we keep the name, but the priority of Jesus Christ is not our priority. That if we can fit him in on our schedule, if we're, you know, if this is a convenient time at 11, we'll come to worship. Or if we have time, we'll open up the scripture and read. Or, you know, if we have time to do this or this. And, you know, we're on holiday right now. We're, you know, or this is a tough school time. This is PSL season. Or uh, these are exams. Or this is the time that we have to do tuition and all of these things. And all of a sudden, Christianity and Christ gets knotted down notch by notch by notch. But as we open up to Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, this is what the word of the Lord says. He says, but if any of you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. However, if any of you deny me before men, I will also deny you before the Father. So we're going to make a distinction between true followers of Christ and true disciples and false disciples. And I'm not going to make that distinction. Jesus is. And he's going to draw a distinction between. And see, either you're going to walk out of here following Christ, truly according to his standard, or you're not. Those are the options that are presented by our Lord. So what does a true follower of Jesus Christ do? Number one, they publicly confess Jesus Christ. That there's no shame, there's no denying, there's no cringing, there's no silence, that we publicly confess. The word confess, I grew up in a very Catholic environment in, our, in, our, in the area we were growing up in the U.S., and a lot of times when we hear the word confess, I had this image as a kid of many of my friends would go to confession. Anybody familiar with the Catholic confession? Where you would go into a cubicle and you would tell all your sins to the priest. And by the way, I'm not in that business, just to let you know, okay? But that's what they did. And so that's my idea of confession. But this word confess is not like that. In fact, it takes two original words. We get our word to speak. We get our word logos, um, the word to speak, and we put it with our word, transliterate it into our word homo, homogeneous, which means the same. So whenever you confess, you say the same thing. So what does that mean? I thought we were supposed to confess our sins. But when you confess Christ, you're saying the same thing that Jesus has already said, that he is the son of God, that he is the only way to God, that he is king of kings, he is Lord. So whether you confess that or not, it doesn't make it untrue. He's already that. We, in our confession, we get to say the same thing God has already said. So we call in Singapore, we double confirm or triple confirm what has already been spoken. And so when you publicly confess, it's not a private confession. This is out loud. In fact, if you look at the context, I know we just started in verse 32. But if you go back a couple of verses, you know that this context is in the midst of hostility. That they're delivering you over the government. They're delivering you over with political agenda. They're delivering you over with other religions. They're delivering you over with your own family, with hate, with hostility, with persecution. And so now he's asking, oh yeah, by the way, whoever confesses. 
Now, it's easy in this environment where we are today to confess. If I were to ask each of you, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I believe most of you would say yes. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, we had baptism when we would announce the statement, Jesus Christ is Lord. And a lot of times there was applause or cheering or there's happiness and there's zeal and there's unbelievable support. But this is not where the confession just takes place. The confession is taking place in hostile arenas. And so if you confess publicly this, it's in the context of persecution. So a lot of times our confession will actually cost us. This is previous service just before we got out. A little young lady lady told me, Pastor, when I was 16, I came to Christ, but I could not speak and I couldn't confess. And my parents would not let me get baptized because we came from another religion. And so yet she was constrained. So many of you understand the persecution when you stand up. But that confession says... It comes with a cost. I love the study of history of, of Christianity in other countries. In Uganda, there was, a, a, there was a, an evangelist by the name of Festo Kaveri, Kaveri Gari. And he said back in Uganda, when Christianity first hit the country of Uganda in 1885, there was a king there that persecuted and put to death Christians. On one particular scene, he gathered up three brothers from the ages of 11 through 15, and not only was he torturing them, he was ultimately going to burn them at the stake for their confession of Jesus Christ. The adults were weeping, the parents were pleading for their lives, but to no avail. But before the the, the burning at the stake, the youngest one, Yusufu, 11 years old, he said, send this message to the king, and this is what he said. Tell his majesty that he's, he may put our bodies in the fire, but we won't be there very long. Soon we shall be with Jesus, which is much better. And then he concluded with this. He said, oh yeah, by the way, ask him to change his mind and repent, or he will land in the place of fire in judgment at 11 years old. That day when they were burned at the stake, 40 adults came to Christ. Christianity begins to spread across all the villages, even in spite of persecution. What was unique about these young believers were that they were young believers. They were not able to read, and yet they had two things going for them. They loved Jesus with everything they had, and they boldly and publicly confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord. So let me ask you again, IBC. Are you a confessing Christian? God says, if you are, I will also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. You confess me, I confess you. You say and agree with what God has said about my son, Jesus Christ, then I, Jesus Christ, will also confess and agree that you belong to me. Only two times in all of the Gospel of Matthew does Jesus identify his father as my father. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, our father, right, who is in heaven. So he doesn't usually use the word my, only in two instances. This one and previously in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 6, Seven, it says, everyone who, who, who says to me, Lord, Lord, does not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So just because you l- literally say with your mouth, Lord, Lord, doesn't guarantee entry into God's kingdom, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Then the other my Father, Jesus uses here when he says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. Why is that so critical? Because he uses the word my, which is a very intimate term with his father, in the times of judgment. When people say, Lord, Lord, but they're not really Christians, then they're not going to go into my father's kingdom. And here, if you do not confess Jesus Christ before people, you will not be identified with my father. So the results and the consequences of confession is that Jesus Christ says you're part of my family. Now, the false teachers are found in verse 33, the false disciples. But whoever denies me before men... I will also deny me before my Father in heaven. So what does the word deny mean? It means no, obviously, but it also means disown, reject. It means put distance. It means that you don't want any association. You you don't want to be noticed or notified. You don't want to be marked out as belonging to him. So when you deny him, you reject him, you say no, you put distance away from yourself, from him and from his name. Now, many of you would say, Pastor, I will never deny Christ. In fact, I'm here in the worship service. I've just sung praises to my Lord. There's three ways that I think you could deny Christ. I think there are more, but I've only picked three to maybe clarify what does this mean. So when it says those who deny Christ, those who reject, renounce, you can do it verbally. So you can actually say, are you a Christian? And you'll say, no. Are you a follower of Christ? No. 
Are you a believer? No. So you can say it openly and blatantly. But the second way may be a little bit more convicting. We could actually deny Christ, renounce him, reject him, put distance from him by our silence. When we're given an opportunity to speak and we say nothing. When you're in a work environment with an opportunity to speak and identify clearly who you belong to and who you serve and who your master is and you remain silent. You shrink and shame, you, you hide, you're undercover. You say, Pastor, I don't, like, silence? Like, but I can't stand up in the middle of a class, in the middle of a lecture and say, I'm a Christian. Or I'm not, I'm in a staff meeting at work. Or, or I'm in a family dinner. Like, what do you do? You just stand up and say it? Maybe a better way to ask this question, maybe more pertinent here, is does everyone around you know that you are a confessing Christian? People you work with, do they know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? People you have dinner with, the people that associate with you, the people that you work with, do they know that you're a confessing Christian? Boldly saying, I, I acknowledge him and confess him as my Lord. The third way, which is even more convicting for me as well, is we can actually deny Christ by our lifestyle. So we say one thing, but we do something else. We announce to the world that we belong to Jesus Christ, but our lifestyle looks godless. We are critical in our spirit. We're judgmental in our attitude. We're prejudiced. We have gossip. We're worried. We're jealous. We're greedy. We're hungry. We have all these other priorities other than Jesus Christ, and yet we confess Jesus Christ is Lord, and yet our lifestyle renounces him. Our lifestyle puts distance between us and him, and it doesn't show our affection nor our allegiance, so we do it by lifestyle. And the consequence of that is, is if you deny me before men with your open, blatant denial, if you deny and renounce me before people and before their faces with your silence and with your lifestyle, Jesus says, I will also denounce and distance and reject you before my Father who's in heaven. Again, this is crushing, right? Because there's been many times I should have spoken, I didn't. There's been many times that my lifestyle doesn't match my mouth. Many times that, that, that my lifestyle doesn't match my lip service. And yet, God says, is that final? One good thing that it says, if you read closely, look at the verb tense. It says, if we confess with Jesus Christ as, as the Lord, as we confess him as, as Jesus Christ as the one that belongs to us, I will confess. Then it says, if you deny him here, he will, which means there's still a future. So if you're here today, you can make a turn, that there's still an opening for you to turn that around and publicly and openly confess Jesus Christ as belonging to you. No longer by your silence, no longer by your lifestyle is there going to be a renouncing or rejection or dis dis distance. Now you can align yourself with him, with your lifestyle. So here it is, you have an opportunity. So for those who have denied, at times I have, are we redeemable? Is it recoverable or is it done? Are we finished? Well, let me give you one name. His name is Peter. Anybody recognize the name? Peter renounced Christ. He denied Christ, but he was brought back into the fold. Again, many times I talk to people and say, Pastor, if you knew my past, you wouldn't be talking to me. If you knew my past, you know there's no hope. I've done so many things that are just so uh, despicable and dishonoring God, and, and I have a whole life full of that. Again, gentle reminder that we cannot undo anything we've done in the past, but we can start today. Today, you have a chance to turn it around. Today, you can start fresh and new and say, you know what, the judgment hasn't come yet because he will either deny, he will confess before his father, but we get to choose today which way we go. What kind of impact does that have, though? Your testimony has a profound impact on everyone who watches your life. As you confess, it makes an impact. As you deny, it makes an impact. In the second century, there was a governor by the name of Pliny. He was a, a governor of a Roman province called Bithynia. And he was persecuting Christians. Now, you may not know the history of Christianity, but by the second century, Christianity was against the law, against the Roman Empire. It was empire-wide persecution. And so Bithynia, this um, pro, um, Roman governor in Bithynia by the name of Pliny, wrote the Roman emperor by the name of Trajan. And he says, this is how I treat Christians. So he began to say, I, I encouraged them to, to, to pledge their allegiance to the Roman government. 
to worship Caesar as God, to, to adopt all of our gods. In fact, I encourage them and tell them, slam and shame the name of Jesus Christ. Deny him, even under the threat of torture and death. And this is what he wrote the Roman emperor as he tried to get Christians, true Christians, to deny their faith. He says, none of these, it is said, those who are really Christians can be compelled to do. True Christians confess Christ publicly. Let me ask you again, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Have you confessed him publicly? Have you denied him with your silence? Have you denied him with your lifestyle? Have you denied him even verbally? God says today it can change. The second part, a true believer, a true disciple, true follower, not only confesses Christ publicly, but places Christ as a priority over family. This is gonna be fun in the Asian environment for the next few minutes. Trust me on this one. This is where it gets a bit challenging. When you're saying, you're telling me you're gonna put Christ over family, over family. So let's see what Christ says about this. Look what it says in verse 34. Do not think I've come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but what? There's a, there's a weapon mentioned here. I did not come to bring peace, but what? Sword. Many times we get this false impression that when Christ comes, peace comes. Everything should be hunky-dory. Everything should be smooth. Everything should be just flowing. Everybody should get along. But Christ says he did not come to bring peace. But he's the prince of peace, pastor. Come on, what's going on? Well, we have a peace between a hostile sinner and a holy God when we've been reconciled to him, but it doesn't automatically bring peace here. In fact, he says, I've come to bring a sword, which is a weapon of warfare. See, the moment you introduce Christ, he becomes confrontational. Something about Christ, either you're drawn to him or you repel him. Either he is the center of your life, the cornerstone, or he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Especially for many of our first generation believers, the moment Christ comes into the home and the whole, a whole entire home is not a believer, you're gonna have conflict. Sometimes I think unity is oversold a bit. Let me give you an example. Perhaps before Christ came, or if Christ would not have come, the world would have gone to hell in unity. Everybody would have been the same. No fighting, no war, just everyone going to hell together. But the moment Christ came, a spiritual war started. Because Satan's not going to let his people and his connections and all of those connected to him simply slip away. Now we're in a spiritual war. So again, Christ did not come to bring peace, but a sword, specifically in the area of family. Let's see what the spiritual impact happens on family in verse 35. For I came, and he quotes Micah chapter 6, so this is, or chapter 7, so this is 800 years before prophesied. He says, when he's come, he will set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. So again, look at the, the direction of these parents to children. A man against his father, which is a son, and a daughter against her mother. And this is when Christ comes in that there's going to be something that will be set against. Now, the English word set against it doesn't do it justice. Literally, it means to incite a rebellion, a revolution. All of a sudden, hostility emerges in a home. And we've seen this again and again in homes in IBC. When Christ comes in, hostility comes. When Christ comes in, all of a sudden, everybody turns against the believer. When somebody gets serious about their commitment to Christ, when everyone else is kind of taking Christ casually, it makes everyone feel uncomfortable. It's everything becomes awkward all of a sudden. And now a man is set against his father and a daughter against his, his mom. And so they're coming in from daughter to mom to son and, and, and father. And now there's conflict constantly being pulled in between. And God's word says that there's trouble here. Again, between disciple and their family. But let's look at it goes on. It says a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, why do they pick on daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws? Because usually whenever somebody married in the first century, they would move into the son's father's home, the patriarchal home. And so now there's another dimension. Now the division is not only spread between parent and child, now it's between extended family. Look at verse 36. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. I can't tell you how many times believers here, especially first generation believers, say, Pastor, my, my family has treated me like an enemy. They've disowned me. They, just, they, they don't talk to me. They've rejected me. They've, they've distanced themselves from me because of my faith in Christ. And here, God's word promises that if you're a follower of Christ, we need to place Christ as a priority over our own family. 
But now we come to the one that's most powerful and piercing. Look at verse 37. He who loves father, mother, more than me, is not worthy of me. Hear that again. This is not my word. This is the word of our Lord. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You look in the Jewish culture, that was the highest honor. Honor your father and your mother. It's a fifth commandment. What do you mean? That he who did not, that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Then he says, he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So now it's a priority, it's a test. Is your family more important than Christ? It doesn't mean that you hate your family. It just means, are they more important than your priority with Christ? Again, we sometimes put family, work, career, school, and God in these separate categories. But God is saying, no, 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 no. If you're a follower of me, if you're a true disciple, you will put me as a priority over these other relationships. Father, mother, son, daughter. Many of you are very familiar with John Bunyan. He wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, the greatest selling book of all history is the Bible. The second one is Pilgrim's Progress. Many of you may not know his story, but when he was preaching, the, 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 the ruler in England told him not to preach, and if he does preach, that he would send him to prison. And he refused that because Christ was a priority. So he continued to preach, and he was in jail for 12 years in prison. And as he was in jail, this is what he said, especially when it came to his relationship with his family for the cause of Christ. He says, the parting of my wife, my poor children, had often been to this place. He's talking about his prison. He says, as a pulling of the flesh from my bone. He says, that's how painful it is to be separated from my family. And then he had one specifically. He says, especially my poor blind child who lay nearer to my heart than all I had beside I saw in this condition, I was a man who was pulling down his house on top of his head, his wife, and his children. But then I thought about it, and I said, I must do it. I must do it. Again, in an Asian context, this is quite challenging. Several years ago, I did a wedding. It was right here, right here on the stage. And during that wedding, we made a very clear pronouncement that a man must leave his father and his mother to be joined to the wife. Now, I had an interesting reaction on that particular occasion. So it was, we were gathering in the back. The wedding was still like the photos were going on. The, 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 the mom, I mean, the, the, the bride still had her dress on. And the mom pulled me aside and said, who do you think you are? I said, what do you mean? <laughs> who do you think you are to tell my son that he must abandon me? That he's going to leave me. Do you know who I am? Do you know Who's told you that? What gave you the right? And she was scolding me in front of everybody. How many of you said that's a warm, receptive wedding? And I said, I had a lot of fleshly thoughts. I'm not going to lie to you. I was not totally in the spirit completely on my initial thought of what I wanted to say. But by the grace of God, I pulled back and took a breath. And I said, I, believe me, my sister, I think your problem is not with me. I believe it's with God. So would you take it up with him? And then I walked away before I said something else. But it's amazing in this culture how sometimes honoring parents takes a priority over honoring God. And God is asking this question not only to you, but to me. So I'm going to put it in personal terms. Is Christ more important than Sasha to me? Direct question. Is Christ more important than my elder son, Austin? Is he more important than my middle son, Hudson? Is he a higher priority than my youngest son? We call him the Omega, Samuel. Is he more important than my daughter in loves? Now we're going to get extra personal. Is he more important than my eldest grandson, Ezekiel, is about to turn five? Is Christ more important than my second grandson by the name of Levi? Is Christ more important than our only girl? Let's get really personal. Than my Zoe. Is he more important than my youngest grandson, Judson? Tough question. But if I'm I'm gonna say Christ, you're my priority. If I'm gonna say Christ, you're my priority and that you're more important 
Remember, this is the same Christ who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So we receive his words very clearly on that. We love the words that Jesus says, peace be still and the storms are calm. We love those words. We love those words that says, get up, rise, you're healed. We love those words. But if we're going to take Jesus, we need to take all of his words. It's not a buffet. We don't pick and choose what words we like from Jesus and which ones we want to discard. Either we follow him or we don't. Either we're true followers or we're not. Either we confess him as Lord or he is not. Either he's more important than our family or he is not. Those are no in between. It's a challenge and a test to each one of us. But I think the core of the problem, though, is found in verse 38. I think once I get past 38, I can put it back in reverse and go through 37 much better. Go through much 36 and verse 35 and verse 32 and verse 33, much better. But look what it says in verse 38. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. See, once I deal with that issue, the family will fall into place. It says, if I do not take up my own cross, I'm not worthy of him. And what does that mean, worthy? It doesn't mean I'm sinless. It doesn't mean I'm stainless. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. No, I'm a failure. I'm a, I, I, I am a, a fragile. I, am, I fall. There's no way I'm worthy based on my merit. The word worthy here means that you're in proper position and posture to acknowledge him as king of kings and lord of lords. And if you cannot say that he is king of kings and lord of lords, you are not worthy to follow him on his terms. If you try to negotiate terms and say, I want to be worthy of you, but I want to keep my family as a higher priority or my own life as a higher priority, then you are not worthy because you have not put yourself in proper position of where he is and where we are. See, I think 20 centuries of Christianity has kind of deadened our ears to this impact that he's just about to make. In Matthew's gospel, this is the first time cross has ever been mentioned. Now, we get the historical part, like we all know it's coming, right? But they've never heard the word cross before come out of Jesus' mouth, and this is it. Now, a first century Jew listening to the word cross, go back about 150 years, there were 800 Pharisees crucified by the Hasmonean king. So they understand what that looks like. In AD 6, there was a Judas of Galilee, a revolutionary, that raised up a, a, a mutiny against the Roman government. And he was killed, and, but yet 2,000 Jews were crucified along the road to Galilee. So when they, and this is where all the disciples were from, Galilee. Most of them probably saw those bodies being lined up on crosses in their home territory. And now he says, you must take up your what? And we know cross is the most agonizing anguish and suffering type of death. It was designed to torment, to be extended over a period of time. In fact, many people are recorded of having been crucified for several days. You usually wouldn't die for lack of blood. You die out of suffocation because you couldn't breathe the way you were hanging on the cross. You had to constantly push up to open and spread your lungs to let the air in. And now God is asking us to what? Take up our cross. I believe there's a misconception in Christianity today that if we can just pray a sinner's prayer and then we can sit with our hands open and wait for the spiritual lottery to hit, for the unpals to flow in, for God's blessing and prosperity and favor to just flow into our lives, and we think that's Christianity. And yet Jesus' own words that says, if you follow me, you must get up every morning and you're on your way to your execution of yourself, of your selfish desires of your gratification, that all of a sudden, that is dead. Then verse 39 calls us to a choice. And this is where he closes up. So if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you must confess Christ publicly. You must place Christ as a priority over your family. And one that hits most personal is you must place the priority of Christ over yourself. And so you call to a choice. And what's the choice? Look at verse 39. It says, he who has found his life will lose it and he who has lost his life for my sake will gain it. Simple math. You hang on to here, you lose there. You let go of here, you gain there. Simple investment. What are you hanging on to? You're hanging on to your CPF? Hanging on to your possessions? Hanging on to your job, your status, your education? Hanging on to your family, your relationships? 
You're hanging on to your, your, your hobbies, your travel, your holidays. What are you hanging on to? God says if you're hanging on and you try to hold on and you're gonna, yes, you may gain here, but you'll lose there. God says also if you lose here for my sake, if you let go of the priorities of here and the pools, the ownership, the shackles, the slavery to all the things of this world, you gain there. Simple question, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Not based on our terms and our making and our manufacture and our shaping and our crafting, but based on his words. Henry Martin was a missionary born in the late 1700s. Went as a young man to India as a missionary. God pulled his heart and says, hey, you've been serving here, but I want you to go to Persia and I want you to translate Persia language in, into a New Testament and give them the word of God in their own tongue. Yet as a young man, he was suffering quite a bit health-wise. Doctors told him he actually had to move from India because it was too hot for his condition, and he would die if he didn't go back home to England. And yet God was going to move him to Persia, which at that time, I don't know how you calculate weather, but at that time, Persia was hotter than India. And so they were, he, he said, I, I, I had to make a decision. God was telling me to do this, and yet the doctors were telling me to do this. My safety would have required to go home, but yet my Lord was requiring me to go to a harder place, more difficult. So he went to Persia, spent nine months there translating, learning the language, then translating the New Testament. Then he made a trip after he had the New Testament translated to Tehran, which was about 1,000 kilometers. And we're talking about 1,800, 1,000 kilometers. He goes to the presence of the Shah in Tehran to get permission to print and he wasn't even granted access to the Shah. He had found out that he had to go back to British ambassador to get the proper papers, so he traveled 640 kilometers back to the British ambassador to get the proper papers. Then he traveled 640 kilometers back to the Shah in Tehran by night on a, on a mule. And finally, he was granted permission to print. Sounds like a great story, doesn't it? And then 10 days later, Henry Martin passes away. But before he dies, he writes these words in his journal. He said, I sat and I thought with sweet comfort and peace about my Christ. In solitude, my companion, my friend, and my comforter. I'm wondering if today you can say the same words. My comforter, my friend, my Christ. No matter what, he, what it costs, no matter where he tells me to go or what he tells me to do, I'm going to publicly confess Christ. At the end of the last service, I had several people say, Pastor, I'm ready to confess Christ in baptism. Some of you have not had that privilege and honor. This is where it all starts, not only in your heart, but in your mouth. And you've never publicly professed Christ in an area of just where God has commanded us to identify with him. God is asking you, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my favorite authors and fathers in the faith, said when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. It's not a come to, for you to enjoy life more in the physical realm, but for you to die to self in order that you may gain life there. So as we close in prayer, I'm gonna ask you a simple question again. Are you a true follower of Jesus Christ? Have you publicly confessed him? Have you put him as a priority over your family? and even more personally, over yourself. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word that never, ever lets us go, that always challenges us out of our comfort zone, out of what is convenient, out of what is oftentimes palatable to our earthly and physical system. Father, we are asking to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and you're calling us to come and follow you, and you're telling us exactly what that looks like. Father, we pray as your word speaks that our hearts and our acoustics would be tuned in and that our answer would be a ready yes. We are followers of Jesus Christ and we confess you as our Lord. And you are more important than my family, my friends, my connections, my network, my career, my job, my school, my status, everything, my assets, my liabilities. And more importantly, Father, you are more important than myself. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just a couple of notes. First, describe a time most recently that you've openly confessed Christ, that you've actually said, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a confessing Christian. 
When's the last time you've done that? So just describe that. Also, we've seen that in our baptisms lately, but we also see it, if you see it ahead, we see it in a chance that you get a chance to confess Christ publicly on a mission trip. We just had a troop group in on the Philippines in Laguna. Um, we have 12 young adults right now, many of them are in um, Unite, that they're in Cambodia right now serving, so they're getting a chance to confess Christ publicly there. Um, Pastor Lloyd is leading a group to Mindora in the Philippines, leaving tomorrow. There's also a group of 14 that is going to Batam, a wide range from elderly to very young, so it's exciting to see that, that range. And then there's a connection group that just had a call from God to say, you know what, we as a connection group want to go on a mission trip. And just impromptu, and they said, okay, so they're doing a one-day trip to KL. So these are all areas where you can confess Christ in a very public and a very bold way. The next one, many of you knew that last week we gave you the report, but let me give you an updated report. 40 children have confessed faith in Christ. Seven of those children are not connected to any church at all. 26 of those children are very connected to our Sunday school, and seven of those kids are in IBC but not connected to our Sunday school. So we've seen God, again, that confession. You remember last week we gave the opportunity for just the giving, um, just a report of $850 came in with the children, remember, for VBS. Well, this week we want to announce and praise the Lord, there are $31,000 that have come in. And so this will help that church. And there's going to be a trip also to the House of Joy in January. So I want you to know that we're confessing church, but not just in home environments, that we need to go to territories that may be a not as conducively warm and welcome, but yet a chance for us to grow strong in our faith. Next slide. And this is a more personal and convicting one for me as well. In what ways have we denied Christ? Openly, perhaps. More convicting to me is denying Christ in my silence when I could speak. Denying Christ in my lifestyle that contradicts my lip service. My life looks different. The last one is to ask God to boldly confess Christ in every situation. So if you're here today, this is my challenge and my charge to you. What is it, and, and I forgot about this question, what does following Christ cost you? And for many of you, it's cost family, friends, relationships, jobs, promotions, Many of you have cost you in, in ways that you, you, we can't even begin to calculate. A lot of times we lean on that, but I want you to lean on the last question. What have you gained by following Christ? Sometimes we forget that. I'm, Sasha and I were having a conversation this past week, and we we're dealing with a lot, of, a lot of challenges. But I said, you know what? Every so often we just ought to remind ourselves, in heaven, all of this will go away. <laughs> that no matter what kind of struggles we are in now, it's not permanent. We're just passing through. But what we gain in heaven far outweighs to what we may lose or what may cost us here. So as the body of Christ, let's stand. And we as true followers of Christ are going to pray this prayer that we've been praying this, the last couple months, the Lord's Prayer. So this one I want you to pray with boldness of your heart and your mouth as true followers of Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Happy Father's Day and happy Followers Day. All right, as we follow Christ with everything we have. God bless you.